Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about um, one aspect of what I call um, the shift to post-enlightenment. If you were here yesterday, I talked about um, the fact that we are actually entering a new era, which is called, in my opinion, post-enlightenment, and it has three signs and three aspects. One is the shift from uh, the wider civilizational shift that we can actually observe from text to images, and uh, which is, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with. Just um, take a look at, for example, how Instagram or YouTube has become popular, how the younger people are more comfortable, well, actually, not just the younger people, everybody around the world, especially even, especially in developing countries, people are more comfortable with sharing and expressing themselves in images and pictures rather than text. Um, then the other aspect is this shift from um, reason or rationality to emotions and effect. That's another very important, I mean, that's the center of it, obviously, anyways, because the enlightenment was, um, was defined as the centrality of, of rationality. And all the achievements of, of the Enlightenment, all the scientific achievements, every other aspect of uh, many of those achievements, obviously there were shortcomings, but much of the achievements were because rationality replaced myths and religious um, uh, beliefs uh, that had no uh, roots in, in rationality. And then the third has been the collapse or the crumbling of of the public truth into the private truth, in a way, and the personalized truth, and truth is in quote, quotes. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the demise of the public sphere, which is one aspect of the demise of the public, or the crumbling of the public into the personalized, uh, which is manifested on the internet, and how the internet has changed from something that was dominated by the web and the World Wide Web into something that is more like television now. So this picture summarizes some of it um, because it's not just that people don't read newspapers anymore, they're also not wearing hats anymore. Uh, and many other things have changed. You know, there are more women in public spaces, in public transport, um, and many other changes, obviously, in terms of the design and the posters and the advertising and all that. Um, so very briefly about uh, where I came from, I started blogging uh, movement in Iran in early 2000s. I introduced blogs and podcasts to a country where I wasn't at the time. I wasn't living in Iran when, when I did that. I was in Toronto, Canada. and. Um, it became a very important development in terms of um, free expression and democratic processes. Um, so it, people started calling it a revolution. And they, they started calling me the blog father of that, uh, of that revolution. Um, but then in 2008, when I went back to Iran, I disappeared. People wondered where I was. I was arrested and then sentenced to almost 20 years in prison um, because of my digital activism and because of my writings. But then six years later, I was pardoned because it was such a um, politically hyped and pumped up case. Um, and I was freed. But then when I came out, I realized that everything has changed. So that's me coming out of the underground in a way, entering a, new, a whole new world of monsters and uh, big corporations who dominate uh, now the, the formerly decentralized and very open space of the internet. Mm. So this is the article, you can still find it. This, became, this article became quite famous when I published it in 2015, a few months after I was released. 
Uh, it was an analysis about how things have changed. The summary of the analysis was, the center of the analysis was the decline of hyperlinks. Because when you look at the main change that has happened, that had happened, you would realize that it's because, it's been because of the hyperlinks and the devaluation of the hyperlinks that many of these things started to change because hyperlinks were, pro, pro, um, were causing this de decentralization. They were allowing this um, very active nature to the internet that it used to be um, and many other aspects, the diversity that it, it had at the time, you know. And with social networks, they don't encourage hyperlinks because it's against the business model, and that's why we don't even talk about the same internet anymore. So it's somehow, it's not about being pessimistic or optimistic because we're not talking about one thing, we're talking about two different things, and the, the previous internet is not the new internet. So we have somehow uh, moved from the internet of books, somehow, the internet which was inspired by books, and I call it books internet, to an internet which is inspired by television, and I call it TV internet. Uh, and the main reason was the hyperlinks, but also the proliferation of videos and the way people actually relate to social media news feeds because you know, it's not just that there are more videos, but the way you relate to this uh, news feed, which is an endless stream of images, and the way you look at it is very similar to, to the way you look at actually a personalized television in your hands. Um, even if it's not television, even if it's not YouTube, even if it's Twitter, but the, the way you relate to it is very similar to the, to the way you, re you relate to television. So this summarizes the change the shift from the books internet to TV internet. It's now dominated by photography instead of typography, emotions instead of reason, entertainment, likes. It's become much more linear, centralized, passive, inward looking. It's based on your habits, you know, because of the algorithms, this is how they, they function. And it's, it also com comforts you rather than challenging you. Raymond Williams, the cultural um, scholar, the cultural studies scholar, uh, sees um, television as three things. One is, is a technology, which, is, which used to be broadcast on television, a cultural form, uh, which is the programming, and then a, as a, a social practice, which is television watching. The same, I argue, goes through, uh, goes through for the internet, because the technology is still broadcast, but it's a personalized broadcast based on the algorithm. Then the stream of images is very similar to the idea of broadcasting, uh, or programming, sorry, that you have with television. And then the social practice is a mix of watching and sharing, which is also interesting. But it's, you know, this model shows you how similar this new internet is to the television. But then there are other interesting similarities. For example, one of the business models, apart from the advertising of this new internet, is product placement. And um, if you've seen Instagram, there are you know, very overtly product placement procedures that you can actually even, um, if you have a big audience, you can actually ask for brands. I don't know how it works actually, but brands start sponsoring you. This is, you know, this is product placement in a way. They send you to, to trips, they send you the products and you could use them. Then you have the prime time on social media, which is, something really strange for people who had experienced the web. It's a certain um, time of the day that if you, for example, if you want to tweet, you have to tweet in those times. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a, as visible as it, as it would be. And also the celebrities on both spaces are becoming the same. If you are a celebrity on, on television, it's very likely that you are a celebrity on, on social media as well. Whereas before, 
the previous internet, the celebrities of the web were completely different from the celebrities of, of, the, um, of the television world. Um, Neil Postman is also important, again, because the t uh, when he wrote this book in 1985, it was the, the height and the, of the popularity of the internet, of the television. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, it ended very quickly with the emergence of the web. Uh, so people stopped talking about the impact of, of television on, on the wider social um, discourse and political discourse. But this specific book, which I recommend, highly recommend to, uh, again, actually um, is very important, again, because now you can actually read it thinking that he's also talking about the new internet, not Absolutely. just television. This is one of, this is a quote from, from that book, which is very true, as you could see now, that Americans no longer, and it just doesn't apply to Americans only. I think increasingly politicians and nations around the world, they don't talk to each other, they exchange images. So that's why I have this idea of maybe elections would be much more relevant and much more intellectual and much more substantial if there are the debates, sorry, the election debates, if they are taken to radio instead of television. They could be longer, much more in depth, and, and all aspects. Maybe that's one way to go. Going back to this picture, there is something else is happening um, um, simultaneously to journalism as part of this shift to post-enlightenment, which is the crisis in journalism. These figures are very revealing. I don't think they would need more explanation. This is about the number of circulation, including digital, which is really shocking. And 1941 was in the middle, the middle of the Second World War, if you remember, remember the dates. So it's, things are pretty bad. Then the number of people who work there in journalism, and then the revenues in the US. But then the, the, the debate is dominated by these questions of business models and quality or ethics. But I don't think this is the, 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 the root of the crisis. News has no cultural relevance anymore. And it has, therefore, it has lost its community value. I'm not talking about journalism. Um, as a whole, lo losing its cultural relevance. News, which was the main output of journalism, has lost its cultural relevance. This is my argument. Journalism has to reinvent itself to, to stay relevant. But its main output, which was its output for almost 200 years, and it was the, the engine of, of its um, economic um, existence, has ceased to have a cultural relevance and then a community value, and I, I'll tell you why. I refer to James Carey's um, work, who was a uh, communication scholar and who introduced the idea of communications as culture and ritual rather than as a transmission of messages. So this is very interesting. Um, this is a very interesting idea about looking at communications as a ritual rather than as a as a transmission of messages from A to B. So when you, put, when you read a newspaper, for example, it's not just that you want, that you're consuming information. You're also participating in something. And this is maybe, um, they can't be more relevant now that people, for example, who've subscribed to the, to the New York Times, it's not just because they want to know about what's happening. It's also an act of resistance against Trump. So whenever they, um, they open it, whenever they, they start reading it, they feel better themselves. They, they define themselves as part of this, um, you know, this conflict, this, this wider sort of dramatic sort of tension that, um, that exists. And this is part of the ritual aspect. Communication is a symbolic process whereby reality is produced, maintained, repaired, and I can't read the rest. 
by James Carey in 1984. <laughs> Transform. Transform, Transform. Transform, yeah. <coughs> so briefly, the argument, my argument about why Nice has lost its cultural relevance is that it's, um, it is drama, and you, you know, from the ritual point of view, Nice, apart from the information, Nice has, is also drama. So what he says, that on the ritual view, news is also drama, not just the information. It doesn't describe the word, but portrays an arena of dramatic focus. So that was one of the functions of the news as drama. Another function uh, has been this nowness that is described by him as something that the middle class 200 years ago wanted the news to do away with the epic, the heroic, and the traditional in favor of the unique original novel and new. That has also changed, I argue. The third aspect has been the globalized experience that news has provided. This is also um, related to the conditions of the two, two centuries ago. Uh, which obviously news was a historical reality. It didn't, came, it didn't come out of the blue. It uh, performed certain functions for certain class of people. And if those things change, then obviously news change as well. This, this was the basis of my argument uh, that I laid out um, in more detail in this piece in The Guardian, uh, another, another version on Medium. So the news drama has many rivals now because um, there are many other better sources of drama that people are willing to pay for. It's not just news like 200 years ago. You have all these rivals and competition. In terms of its globalized experience as the function, it now has these rivals as well, Instagram, cheap international traveling, and YouTube. But then we also have a simultaneous shift from the local, from the global to the local. We don't see the, the, the same interest that people had, um, used to have about uh, the wider world, the global things, and the rise of identity politics and the local artisan products, and all these things are um, signs for this shift inwards and towards the local again. And to many people, actually, local news um, is summarized as updates about friends and family. It's not the municipality news and those kinds of things that used to dominate the definition of the local news. And the new celebrities are, um, and, and celebrities are actually, celebrities actually fit into this picture because they are your friends and family that you don't see anymore. News as a nowness has also, uh, mm -hmm got some new rivals because it's losing to mobile phones and tweets and news alerts that nobody wants to pay for. Um, so if Telegraph made the production of the news uh, detached, it detached production of the news from the time, mobile phones have detached the distribution of news from time. So the nowness function is also lost now. So now instead of this, we have events reaching the public directly. So you don't need news, news outlets to do that necessarily. So that's the reality now in many aspects. And it's the end of news as this, with this definition, the 800 word stylistic text produced by news organization, in inverted pyramid, as the main output of journalism. It's not the end of journalism, though, um, because journalism is democracy, as James Carey says. It's not helping democracy. It is democracy, and both are public conversations. Journalism and politics mutually form one another they are symbiotic. Democracy and journalism are names 
of the same thing. It's a very important, interesting argument and essay that James Carey wrote in 1984. So the future of journalism basically is where art meets different uh, forms of journalism. And it's very dramatic. It's long-form narrative. That's the future of journalism. It's already happening. We have some very good examples of, of it. For example, literature and journalism. We have non-fiction books. We have narrative podcasts. Cinema and journalism is selling very well. Documentaries and documentary films, or even films or series based on true stories. Painting and journalism, graphic novels. Theater and journalism, but there is still uh, space to, to grow that experience. But then you can actually even think about more innovative forms of journalism when, when you mix music with journalism. Or how about dance and journalism? Or how about a mix, dance, music, theater, journalism, which is uh, maybe opera. So this is the sad reality today. It's post-enlightenment, I'm saying. Again, but it doesn't mean that we have to give up on the ideals of the Enlightenment, such as democracy. Thank you.